So welcome everyone. I think we're about to start. It's my great pleasure to welcome Mitch Silver here to talk at the GSD tonight. Mitch is the president of the American Planning Association, a position he's held for two years. Um, he's managed, going to manage to step down in a couple of months. As well as being president of the American Planning Association, he's the chief planning and development officer and planning director of the city of Raleigh, North Carolina. Now, this is a really big job. He oversees a business enterprise that um, includes 230 employees, three departments, including city planning, community development and inspections, four offices, transportation planning, economic development, development services, and the Urban Design Center. So he's a planner who is managing quite a lot of city business in a way that you'll see as exemplary. He's led the comprehensive plan update and rally, as well as working on zoning ordinances and many other things. His aim is to make rally a really a national model for urban planning. Before coming to rally in 2005, uh, Mitchell worked as the policy and planning director in New York City. He was in a consulting firm. He was a town manager in New Jersey, and he was deputy planner in Washington, D.C. He received a bachelor's degree in architecture from Pratt Institute and a master's degree in urban planning from Hunter College. I met Mitch about 15 years ago when we were on a panel in New York City. I think it was 15 years ago. I can't remember where I was traveling from to get to this panel. And uh, he's long been known as a, an outspoken voice for planners embracing the future in a more substantial way. And I look forward to hearing more about that tonight. Welcome. Thank you, Anne, uh, and members of the faculty, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I got to meet some of the faculty members earlier today and, and truly want to thank you for the work that you do, uh, really having conversations and helping to stimulate the thinking of our emerging leaders and planners of tomorrow. Uh, I do see a lot of friends in the room. Uh, Zab Briggs, someone I had met, wow, 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, when he was a member of the New York Metro chapter and, of course, have gone on to bigger and greater things. And Bob Mitchell, former AICP commissioner and chapter president in Massachusetts chapter. I know I saw Bob somewhere, uh, so I want to welcome them and good to reconnect with old friends. Uh, a little bit about APA before I start. Uh, we're an organization of close to 40,000 members. And what most people don't know is we have members in over 90 countries. So although the American Planning Association, our reach is now global, and we try to do our best to reach out and serve all of our members across the country. For those of you who are students, we do offer free membership the first year, then reduced membership. And we also have a young planners group in the chapter. So I encourage all of you, if you have an opportunity, get active with the local chapter here. And I can tell you, you will find it very, very rewarding. Well, I am very pleased to be here uh, tonight. I had a chance to meet with some of the students earlier. I kind of gave them some uh, teasers and a trailer so I'd make sure they would come back and I think the room is full so I'm glad they took my advice uh, but my goal is to share some information with you and my hope is that when you leave this presentation you will not be the same or think the same about planning uh, you will see when I finish this presentation that we're dealing with some emerging issues uh, that warrant a new focus and new attention and so I hope you will agree with me that when I finish this presentation It'll really force you to refocus the work that you're doing. Uh, now, before I start, I want to share a little bit about myself uh, because I will be talking about uh, issues of race in the presentation. And so I always like to share with people uh, in terms of my background uh, because I'm very blunt about the issues of race. Uh, my father, uh, who passed away this year, is white and Jewish, and his family migrated here from Germany. Uh, my mother is black and Haitian and Catholic, and migrated here, of course, from Haiti. So if you put a white Jewish from Germany and a, a black woman who's Catholic from Haiti, put them together, what you get is a born-again Christian. Uh, <coughs> I get along myself totally well. Uh, there's no inner turmoil. The Old Testament side gets along with the New Testament side. There's no problem. But what I found interesting is throughout my life, I was called many, many different things, half-breed, zebra, mutt. If you're mixed race, you may identify with it. But it wasn't until the 1990s when I really got excited when they finally came up with a new term for people of color. And this is because of the Halle Berry's and Alicia Keys. And they now call it exotic. 
So I stand before you as the exotic president of the American Planning Association. So let's go right into the presentation. And I first want to talk about this notion about planning. Because a lot of people perceive planning and planners different ways. Regulators, bureaucrats, they're ingrained in process. In fact, I challenged a lot of planners that what does the P4 stand in planning? Is it process or is it planning? It's planning. And I want to make sure, as I was president, we put the P back in APA for planning and not process. Not that it's not important, but we are the American Planning Association and not the American Process Association. But when we deal with the public, there's a big difference between planning and zoning, and the public often confuses the two. They think they're one and the same, and they're very different, as you'll see in a second. And you'll see that when I talk about what planning is, we have to make sure we communicate that to the public, because it is very vital for how we plan uh, for our communities. So the plan. The plan or planning, basically comprises a plan, talks about the vision and values for the future. It shouldn't have a must or a shall in it. It's advisory. It's giving you basically the policies and the vision of where you want to go in your community. And then you have the code, the law. That is basically you code for that vision to make sure it is implemented. And the purpose of a code is to protect the public health, safety, and welfare that goes back to the very beginning of our profession. And the point I want to make is that most codes you see today are moving, I won't say far away, but they look a lot more like citywide homeowner association documents. They look like zoning codes. So I want to remember, all you not to forget, that when we look at zoning, the purpose is to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. It's very different than a plan and zoning, but the public always confuses the two for one another. And just to remind you, if you did not know this about zoning, uh, the first zoning ordinance was 1916 in New York. Uh, zoning basically evolved in the 1920s because the business community was concerned about their property rights. When they saw all these things happening, they approached the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and said, you've got to do something. My property rights were being affected. And there was zoning before zoning. It was restrictive covenants, deed restrictions, and basically neighbors just sued each other. If they didn't like what they put there, they just sued their neighbor. And they found out that this was not effective. We needed something else in place. And the biggest concern at that time for these lawsuits and concerns, multifamily housing, industrial uses, and selling your home to Jews and blacks. That was the big fear at that time. And as a result, we had zoning. Now it's taken a whole different form today about property rights. But I want you to understand the origin of zoning so that you understand the context. So why do we have planning? What's up with this profession? Planning is a response to growth and change. And if you look at the history of the United States, let's go at least back to the 19th century, we had a population of 5 million. Urbanized population, 6%. You go to the 20th century, we've now grown to 76 million, primarily because of immigration from Europe. Urbanized population, 40%. And just about 13 years ago, our population was close to 300 million, urbanized population, 80%, and now, as we look to the 22nd century, our country will grow to 570 million with an urbanized population of 90%. Now, when we talk about planning, people see 22nd century and say, wow, that's a long time off. A child born today could live to see the 22nd century. So we have to keep in mind, when we talk about 50 years or 80 years, literally that is within someone's lifetime today, and we have to be mindful of that. But this change, this growth is affecting our country. In fact, if you look over the next 50 years, the United States is expected to grow by 124 million people. We will have to find where to place and build 40 to 50 million new housing units to house that population in addition to absorbing the existing housing stock. My question is, what will the next generation of housing look like in communities? I mean, this is a lot of development, and the question is, do we want to look like the 1950s, or are we going to change going forward? And during that same time period, the world population will grow by 2.3 billion people. This is why we need planning. Some will grow in locations. Some will migrate to different locations. Some will immigrate to this country. And our role is to adapt to this growth and change. 
I'll put it to you quite simply. It's like we have a challenge of two centuries or a tale of two centuries. The 20th century was defined by urbanization. People were moving from the country, moving to the city, and urbanizing these locations. That was a challenge. But the 20th century is now we're dealing with the challenges and the effect of suburbanization and what the automobile and those land use patterns have affected our country. That's what we're all dealing with today, the effects of the automobile and the suburbanization. And this will go on because people are still in love with their cars and they're still in love with the suburban lifestyle. Even though we want it to go away, it is still a lifestyle choice for many. But that is how we're defining this challenge. But this term urban, and I shared it with the students earlier today, is very confusing to a lot of people. When I say urban, and I'm in a public meeting and ask someone what does it mean, their minds go into that popular hip urban in terms of crime and ghetto and you know attire, when in fact the census is saying it's something very different. They define it as an urbanized area is 50,000 or more, or an urban cluster between 2,500 and 50,000. Both those pictures you see there are considered urban. How many people here in a room grew up in an area between 2,500 and 50,000? Would you consider where you grew up urban? And the answer is no. And so this idea, when we use this term urban very loosely, to me this is one of the most confusing words in our profession because when I use it, it means different things to different people. But we keep saying urbanized and urbanization. What do we really mean? Because urban includes urban, suburban, and the fringe. Now, what does it look like? This is our map of the United States. The purple dots are the urban areas, and the green dots are the urbanized clusters. And as you can see, it's mostly concentrated in the east, uh, in the Midwest, and of course on the West Coast. I happened to go to one state out west, I won't name it for fear of embarrassment, and I was, it was one of those western states where there's only a few green dots, and I said, wow, I'm so excited you have a green dot. I finished a presentation, this is a true story, the gentleman got up and said, ladies and gentlemen, I see the map, our job is to work to get the green dots off of our map. I mean, what are you going to do, take a nuclear missile and take the town out? I mean, to them, urban was like, get it away from me. You don't understand, this is rural, open space culture. Please get that urban as far away from me as possible. We have to be mindful that 62 million Americans still live in rural or non-urbanized areas, and we cannot forget about them. We're all talking about mega regions, about the, the strength of our economy, and we're going to be defined by metro areas, but that includes urban, suburban, and rural. Those states and those regions that understand we have to connect all three and stop pitting urban against rural will be the country, will be the region, and will be the state that will move ahead in the 21st century. It is no longer a strategy to pit one against the other. We have to figure out how to tie those economies together and not forget about the lifestyle because 62 million Americans live there. That number will shrink, but we have to realize how important they are to the growth of our country. And so I was sharing this with the students earlier today. That this is my list of basically a snapshot of the playing profession for the past 150 years. What I tried to do is show you that in each period, the profession had some emerging issues and challenges of their time, but it never stayed the same. It changed. At the dawn of our profession, the birth of the movement, I mentioned it earlier, people were moving from the country to the city. It was congestion, poor sanitary conditions, poor housing conditions. People were dying because we did not have plans in place to keep them healthy and alive. But we moved on from there. And if you look at this, Era after era after era, there was emerging challenges before our time. And guess what? The planners changed to step up to those challenges. So some people have us frozen in the era of eminent domain and urban renewal and haven't forgiven us for that period. We've moved on from that already. And the point I'm trying to make is now we're moving out of this era of anti-sprawl, new urbanism, smart growth, and even sustainability. 20 years from now, you'll say, do you remember that word, sustainability? Oh, I remember that back when we were at GSD and we were talking about that. It, the three E's will remain. The term is going to change because economy, the environment, and equity have been there from the very beginning of our profession. My only hope is as we go forward and we talk about being sustainable, we won't forget about the forgotten E, equity. If you're not pursuing equity, you're not being sustainable. The three go hand in hand. But the big question is, as we now move to 2010 and beyond, the big question is, what's next? What's next? 
Now, after the recession, everybody's asking that question, what's next? And we're not alone. ULI, architects, landscape architects, CNU, everyone's asking the same question. What's next? Because we feel it. In the work that we do, in our profession, in conferences, we notice with everything that's happened, something's going on, and we're now approaching this, what's next? We're all asking this question. And I challenge you about this, what's next, because all of us, I hear on a regular basis, talk about resilience and adaptability. You know, communities have to be resilient and adaptable. Let me put the communities aside. What about you? Are you, as professionals, going to be resilient and adaptable to the changing times? Because if you can't apply that to yourself, I don't know if I'm a resident for a person from a local government if I want to hear that from you because resilience and adaptability is what's going to mark our profession because we're going to go through a lot of changes and life, life cycle changes throughout our profession. So I do believe in resilience and adaptability, but I also believe we need to apply this to our own profession and our own lives. So without any of the chapters in APA talking to one another, just to show you how this trend has been going on for the past couple of years, here's just some of the conference themes that have gone on just in 2012. They haven't even talked to each other and coordinated. Planning for the next generation, planning for the next 50 years, charting a new course, regaining relevancy, dream big. And I can go on and on with another 20 or 30 chapters all under the same theme. So you are living right now, if you're just coming out of school, this is an exciting time because one of those changes in our profession is happening right now. So pay attention in class because you will help define the next conversation for the next era in our profession. So please pay attention. Thank you for coming to class at the right time. I thank you. My concern about planning, I think the challenge we've experienced as I talk to people is many planners have lost their sense of purpose. They forgot why they got into this profession in the first place. After five or 10 years in the profession, they got so comfortable processing applications and stamping permits that they forget their role. And my hope is that our mind planners what their true sense of purpose is. One, what I like to share with them, is that planners are unique because I believe you're guardians of the future. It's what makes your profession distinct from other professions. You think not only about current, but future generations. And my challenge is, if you don't think about these things, who will? Who will? It's what separates us because I'm telling the residents, my job is to take the uncertainty about your future. If you invest in this community, if you live in this community, my job is to help take that uncertainty so that you want to open a business here, you want to invest here, and you want to stay here. That's part of my job. Elected officials don't think about that day and night. That's up to us to do. That's our challenge. Planners protect the public interest. I go to city council sometimes, and I wear planning permission. I see that attorney arguing the point of view for that private applicant, and they're passionate making their point of view. And I look around and saying, well, then who's representing the public interest? Who's standing up for children who aren't even born yet, dealing with that application or dealing with their project, arguing on their behalf? When I go to a court of law, I see a plaintiff and a defendant, attorney representing both. When I go to a plan commission, there's just one representative. Move for approval, and I'll say, wait a minute. My job as a planner is to represent the public interest. And just like the guardian, if there's nobody in that room to represent the public interest, who will? It's very important that we understand that. Now, part of my job, and this is part of our code of ethics, is that planners shall have a special concern for the long-term consequences of present actions. Now, I stand before my counsel, this happened yesterday, and there is a specific issue, and I believe I have an obligation, although they want to move for approval, that it's my obligation, ethical obligation, to share with them the consequences of that decision. It takes courage and it takes boldness, and I can tell you sometimes I'm sweating right through my jacket, but I feel I have an ethical responsibility to say, I know you want to do this, but I'm obligated to tell you the consequences. But what's interesting is, yes, there are consequences for actions today, but what I find the worst example is there are consequences for taking no action. And in fact, as I travel the country, that's what I see as more of a tragedy. We're telling people about the emerging trends. I don't believe you. I'm putting my head in the sand as if that's going to go away. It's not. There are consequences for taking no action 
And we as planners, and in our profession, have to have the courage to say, if I just say no, there are consequences, and share what those consequences will be. And then when I work with residents, a lot of them say no. I'm sure if you're planners, you've heard this often, or town hall meetings, that if people say no to something, we have to tell them, you're saying yes to something else. You say no to density, what you're really saying is yes, seniors and young people, we don't want you in our community. When people say no to something, they're saying yes to something else. And it's part of our job to have that conversation so they understand the implications of the decision. Because if they say no, well, the public said no, let's move on. No, wait a minute. There are some consequences for that action. So here's some did you know. Number one, did you know that in 2009, the US News and World Report named planning as one of the top 50 professions in 2010? I don't know what they said in 2011 and 2012, but in 2010, we were the profession. And as I said earlier, did you know, because I get calls from mayors, they're looking for planners with vision, with courage, with boldness, plan directors in particular, who will help them take their community to the next level. And unfortunately, I can't find that many, maybe a handful. So I'm now going to shift into some of the emerging trends. And the conversation is that I want planners to understand, understand and frame these issues for the public. I know we do a lot of visioning, but I believe you have to understand the emerging trends. You've got to track trends and challenges like a stockbroker watches the market. This is your job. You need to understand and watch where the community is going so you can give them advice. So this is my list. I'm sure people have other lists of the emerging, in my opinion, issues in the 21st century that we'll be dealing with. A couple of things about this list. Number one, some items on this list have never happened before in American history. Never. First time. So you can't Google to get the answer for these. Can't. It'll require new thinking and innovation to address these problems. Graying and browning of America, rise of single person household. I'll get to some of these in a second. The other thing about this list, young people in this room, this is going to happen under your watch. So you need to pay attention and start thinking and innovating today. Now, us seasoned professionals and your professors, as I said earlier, we're going to give you the tools to help solve these problems. But when we went to school, we didn't have issues like this. I mean, these are different. These are game changes for our country, and these are game changes for the entire world. Because the graying issue in Japan, I don't know if you heard this, they're now selling more adult diapers than baby diapers in Japan. Did anybody hear that? I mean, we are aging as a world. And it has implications, which I'll share with you. So that's the issue about this list. So let's move what I call the remix of the 21st century. And I'll go through a couple of these, and then we'll talk about the implications. The first is going to talk about aging in households. Now, you probably heard about this now. It's been in the news for a while. But by 2030, one in five Americans will be over the age of 65. Today, one in five Americans are disabled. And that number is likely to grow. But, I don't know if you knew this, by 2050, the number of Americans over the age of 85 is going to triple by 2050. The average will now be 82.6 from 5.4 million to 19 million. We have not seen this before. This is brand new to our country, and now even AARP is now working with APA to figure out how do we start planning for these issues going forward. But this is the real game changer, which we'll see in a second. By 2025, the number of single-person households will equal that of a family household. And by 2030 and beyond, for at least a generation, the predominant household in America will be one person. Not a family, one person. So as all of you are planning and designing for the future, your market is about to change. And if you're not aware of it, you may be caught by surprise. Now let's look a little bit deeper into what's going on. Now, there's something called a natural decrease. And what's happening, initially, they had a different term, which the Census Bureau got upset about. They called it dying counties. So now we're calling it shrinking counties. <laughs> but basically, 25% of all counties are shrinking away. The common denominator is that older whites can no longer have children. And then their children are saying, I'm not staying here. I don't like the lifestyle. I don't like the job opportunities. I'm leaving. I'm not staying here. And we see this happening across the country. So when I tell you that 62 million Americans in rural areas, this is one of the phenomenons. I don't want to stay. I'll go to Austin. I'll go to Boston. I'll go to Raleigh. I'll go to New York. I'm not staying here. 
and you see them leaving. So this is what it looks like in your state. If it's beige, those are your shrinking counties. No surprise, you know that they're happening out here, Oops, excuse me, you know they're happening uh, <clears throat> out here in the western part of the state, and I guess this is Cape Cod? Yes? Okay, Whew. all right, <laughs> pass the geography test. Uh, but I'm gonna show you the worst state is West Virginia. That's what West Virginia looks like. The only reason why this color is deep is because that's the DC, part of the DC metro area. Now people are commuting from West Virginia because housing is more affordable at that location. Now since I do these wherever I go, one of the worst that I've seen, you wanna see a real bad one, even though West Virginia is worse than this next state, this is Kansas. I, I want you to take a look at what's going on and the planners in the state didn't even know. You're the planner of this, in this state of Kansas and you didn't know this was going on. There's this out and out warfare between KCK, Kansas, and KCMO because this is the only game in town for job creation. Why are you surprised they're incentivizing jobs to go across the border? If you looked at the map, you would have figured it out like that. These are the issues that we're dealing with and as planners, we have to figure out with the changing demographics and the aging that these are the issues that we have to deal with. If they won't come to us, they'll definitely go to somebody else. Let's look at families. Huge change. Back in 1960s, five out of 100 children were born out of wedlock. You fast forward to 2009, four out of 10, for whatever reason. It's not just blacks, it's whites and Hispanics across the board. There are just more and more children are born to unwed mothers and more than half of the mothers today under 30 are single. That's a generation you're gonna have to plan for. Parks and Rec, public space, that's a generation that you're going to have to plan for. Part-time fathers or no father at all, these are the kind of communities you'll be planning for during your career. So these things that you need to be aware of. Let's look at uh, marriage rates. Now, I usually joke around when I go to some college campuses because I see this guy talking to this young lady throughout my whole presentation. I say, young lady, he's not serious. How do I know? <laughs> this chart tells me so. <laughs> for whatever reason, and I don't know, maybe some in the room will tell us. Back in the 1960s, around 80%, depending on whether you're college or not in college, got married between that sweet spot, 25 and 34. You move, look at today, it's now hovering around 50%. Who knows, people are waiting longer to get married. We don't know the phenomenon, but now we're seeing the numbers drop. So people said, don't worry about our suburbs because they'll get married and have kids. Well, only half of them are getting married and when they do, do decide to have a child, the woman will say, that's okay, I'll raise them on my own. This is who you're planning for. Planning is about place and people, not just about place. And so you have to understand who you're planning for because it's about to change during your career. So you definitely have to pay attention to what is going on. So here's just another slide to show you the dramatic change of households with children versus those without. And just take a look by 2025. Households without children is about to change by 2025. This is going to happen, young people, during your career. And then us boomers, we're going to be around for a while, so uh, I'm sure we'll be dealing with this as well. So what are the implications? Number one, we live in an auto-dependent society, at least I do in the South. I'm sure certain parts of the state do. What happens when a person turns 65 or 70 and realizes they can no longer drive? And we're dependent on an auto-centric society. The recent number right now is 600,000 residents, Americans over the age of 70, stop driving every year. Now, people can drive until their 80s and 90s. My father stopped driving in his late 80s. We were in a parking lot in Florida, and after he hit a couple of cars, I said, Dad, it's time. So if any of you were in St. Cloud, Florida, and you were in a parking lot and your car got hit, it was my dad. I'm so sorry. But we all know that. And if you take a look at what's happening nationwide, that 50% of Americans over 65 have poor transit access. The poster child is Atlanta, sorry Atlanta. In just two years, 90% of people over the age of 65 in Atlanta have poor transit access, just two years. Now, when people tell me about planning I'll, and say they don't believe in planning, I'll tell them, you know something? I'm sure the planner said something, but this is a region that said, Bill, 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 don't tell us what to do. Atlanta, do your own thing. Marietta, do your own thing. Don't you tell us what to do. And now they have a regional mess, tried to pass a transportation bond and failed, and that problem cannot be solved in two years. It can't. They're heading toward a crisis, and their job growth is almost flattened. 
because it's region-wide congestion. Good news is they're now leading the nation in life cycle housing and aging in place. So they realize it's a problem, and now you see the Atlanta Regional Commission stepping it up and there's more cooperation. Now, I shouldn't talk while well, Kansas City is number one. Raleigh, I don't know why they have Raleigh-Durham. We're just Raleigh, not Raleigh-Durham. Just Raleigh. Uh, we're number five. But here's the good news. We caught it early when we were doing our comp plan. We have a plan in place. So now the seniors in our community, we took that uncertainty because we were tracking this trend and we caught it in time. We now have a plan in place to deal with this issue. The other issue, I'll stop on a, uh, the, the top one. Let me go to the second bullet. Planners, this is what is exciting. The older people get, the more nimby they become. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> so the very solutions you need to help them, they're going to say no, no, and no again. So we're dealing with it. And guess what? They vote more than us and put elected officials that support their cause. So we've got to understand the dynamics have, that are happening with an aging population. Uh, I'll leave this one. Let me go back to this for a second. Uh, depending on your state and how you allow seniors to either uh, look for property tax relief, uh, but some states do allow this, and if you do, please watch what's happening to your, uh, your tax base because if you do allow seniors uh, a discount, it starts to put pressure on others, and what we're seeing more and more uh, is more with the shrinking tax base. Local governments are now consolidating. In the last five years, over 400 local governments consolidated or just disappeared because they no longer went bankrupt. They just could not afford the tax bills. And we have 89,000 local governments in the U.S. Did anybody know that? How dysfunctional is that? 89,000 local governments. So I'm telling planners, keep an eye on your tax base, particularly if you allow tax relief like we do in North Carolina, if you turn 65. Other implications, younger people and older seniors, uh, prefer different transportation choices, urban living. So this is another implication. Hope you're doing that in your community. Rental is not a bad thing. It is a housing choice that people are preferring. Uh, smaller homes and a preference to rent rather than own. So when I said earlier, if you tell people you don't want rentals in your community, you're really sending a message where seniors and young people, we really don't want you here. And you kind of need them to help keep your economy strong. So there's going to be a reality check. The one that's freaking everybody out comes from Arthur Nelson and his work where he's estimating there'll be 25 million single-family homes on the market by the 2030s because there'll be a disconnect between the buyer, a single person, and the product, a house built for a family. Okay, I know everybody's thinking here going, they're calling their spouses now, time to sell, sell, sell. You got to the 2020s, don't worry. And it will be regional. I think out in West uh, and certain parts of the South it's going to be hit harder, but I know he's doing research and we're looking how to absorb that housing stock but again, you now see the demand for single families for the first time really starting to drop, even though you see in the news that's changing. This is an issue we're going to have to contend with. Another issue, personal one that I have, is the resiliency of post-war of, of the housing stock. We all know pre-war construction, I'm sure a lot of it built here, Massachusetts. That stuff is solid as a rock. You hit the wall, you break your fingers. Post-war, you put your fist through, goes through three walls. Quality is very different. Craftsmanship versus inferior material, build it quickly. And we had a boom in the 1980s and 90s. Here's my question to you. What happens when that housing stock reaches 50? Because I know homes that are now 20 years old and they're falling apart. Very different than pre-war construction. Yet in Raleigh, 85% of our housing stock was built after 1980s. We have a ticking time bomb in our community that's headed our way. And my challenge is, are we, I told you earlier, we have 40 to 50 million new housing units. Are we going to do things differently? Because right now, that product is not resilient. I have a 1993 home. I'm looking to sell. I got to do so many repairs just so I can put it up for sale. That's a shame. But that's where we are right now because the building code and home builders are driving uh, a lot of the, uh, the codes and regulations. And we have to sit down and have a conversation. And so we now see the sizes of homes dropping. And in fact, a realtor told me this is what people are now asking for. And please listen carefully, because it took me a while to get it. People are now saying they want smaller homes with lots of big rooms. <laughs> That's what they want, smaller homes with lots of big rooms. I'll tell you what that means later, because a lot of still don't like, what? I don't. Yes, it does make sense. People just don't want any walls, just one house with no walls. And so my challenge is, 
the home builders are saying when they took a survey that energy efficiency and smaller homes is now on everyone's list. So can we work with the home builders to keep their same price point, but figure out how to get building codes and building material that's more resilient since we're going to build a whole new generation of housing? People will exchange quality for size, and you can keep the same price point and keep your same profit margin. But we have to start rethinking building codes and building material because what we have right now for the next generation and with all the events and climate change issues, that this housing stock is just not resilient going forward. Pre-war, yes. Post-war, I'm not sure. Let's look at race and ethnicity. You probably know this now. I've been doing this for a number of years, so it shouldn't be as a shock. When I used to share this, people would get upset and scream and say, you're lying and run out the room as if that was going to change the future. But here are the numbers. 2042, that's the S now they're saying 2043 uh, is when we'll have no majority race in the U.S. And you can see where the population is going to shift uh, from all the major races and ethnicities uh, by that time. Uh, you can see the biggest change is between the white population and the Hispanic population. Both black and Asian will roughly stay relatively flat. And so uh, you'll see the huge change in the Hispanic population reminding people this has nothing to do with immigration because people see that and say, that's it. We have to just put walls at the border. You could put up the walls, the dogs, the shotguns, the nuclear missiles. That will not change that number. That has to do with the fertility rate, which is dropping for Hispanic women who are here in this country today. So this is the reality that we have to deal with. And I think the last election was a wake-up call for everyone, and they're finally paying attention. And so we are seeing an increase in the, by 2023, uh, more than half of all children in the U.S. will be minority, and by 2050, it'll be 62%. So this is a reality. If we want to be competitive in the 21st century, and the way we're educating the next generation of children to be the lawyers, doctors, innovators, scientists, mathematicians, I don't know how patriotic we are if we don't concentrate more on this next generation if we want to be competitive in the 21st global economy. So that's another serious issue to pay attention to. So what will America look like? This is courtesy of PolicyLink. Uh, and this is a time lapse between 1980 and 2000, 20, 2040. Uh, so this is what America looked like. The darker the color, the more intensity of people of color, lighter the color, uh, it's 30% less intensity. So this is 1980, 1990, this is 2000. We'll stop right here. This is where we are today. I guess you can see Massachusetts, not too bad. We'll keep an eye on Massachusetts up there. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's see what happens. Oh, there, a little bit now, 2020, 2030, and then 2040. Isn't that exciting? I get the same reaction wherever I go. It's OK. This is what is freaking everybody out in this last election. How do we? thrive as a country. Now, this freaked Raleigh out, and I said, what are you worried about? Our population is down to 53% white, and you didn't even know it. They didn't even know it, because I showed, I have numbers for Raleigh, and they were all like, oh my goodness, I'm just like saying, it's happened. There's no riots on the street, you know, no warfare is going on, everything, still a great community, high quality, schools are great, but when people imagine and fast forward what this means, fear kicks in. And as planners, we're going to be on the front line because we deal with neighborhoods and schools, and that's what's near and dear to people's hearts. And so, now, this happened in Raleigh. As you can see, this was November 2010. Now, personally, I would have used a different headline. I mean, the headline's like, you know, but <sighs> whites out. No I mean, I would have just phrased it a different way. But it got everyone's attention. Uh, but the implications, planners, you're going to deal with on the front line is neighborhoods are going to change. It will vary from region to region, from state to state. It will not be the same. But be prepared that these issues are going to come. School diversity policies will be an interesting debate to watch, although Boston, you're a leader in that regard. When we hear about your school system, Wake County, we're trying to do the same, although we had some bumps. But uh, the 2020 census, even though 2010 was a wake-up call, 2020 census is going to be a real wake-up call. And I predict that the election cycle, let me get back up here for a second, uh, between 2024, 2020 and 2024 is going to be very, very ugly. Why do I say that? Number one, this will determine the districts, the congressional districts and voting districts for the next 10 years where we're going to see major changes in diversity. And that is the next. So we have a mid-cycle 
and then we have the first presidential election. There's going to be some ugly stuff going on from 2018, basically up to 2024, my prediction. Because now diversity is really taken. You're already seeing voter suppression. You're seeing all the stuff going on. It's going to get worse, a lot worse. So as planners, please be at the front line and help your community work through this. There's not much you can do on the governance side, but just be aware that there'll be a lot of fear and concern as we move to uh, the 2020s. Now, let me talk about generations here for a second. When I plan for a community, I don't just look at one general community. We break up our community by generation. Now, I'm going to generalize, so don't take any of this personally. Um, these are basically the, the six generations that are alive today. Everyone in this room is on this list. If you're not, you're dead. So I'm confident everyone in this room is on this list. <laughs> and we're going to go through it briefly, but again, I'm going to generalize. Uh, so uh, please do not take any of this personally. The reason why I do this is that each one of those generations have different values, needs, and aspirations. They're different. And neighborhoods and communities and cities also represent a market demand and a preference. And you have to look at them that way. The best analogy I can give is anybody ever uh, owned a Polaroid camera in a room? Wow, how many people still use a Polaroid camera? Seriously? Now, do you like digitize it or you just actually use it? He's shaking his head both. OK. <laughs> Here's my point. We still have communities that want to build digital camera communities. I'm sorry, a Polaroid camera communities for a digital camera generation. There's just a total disconnect in the market, and that's what we're facing right now today. So let's go through these generations. This is my father uh, before he passed away, and a picture of him when he went to World War II. Uh, my father, you know, World War II, the Great Depression, very different than the Great Recession today. I heard stories about my father growing up. I grew up with hand-me-downs. I don't know who else grew up with hand-me-downs. But my problem is my brother was six foot four, so all of my clothes hung all the way off my body. But this generation knew how to save. My father had a credit card and paid off the entire bill when it came in. Did not want to own any debt. And there was a, something remarkable about the way he thought and how he valued everything, but he saved before he bought. But what I love best about my father's generation, it was in um, Thomas Friedman's book. This generation gave their today for our tomorrow. They gave their today for our tomorrow, and we've never seen a generation like that since. There's about less than 2% left of them on the face of the United States. That's it, 2%. And so that is a very different generation. No one else, in my opinion, can touch them. And so that, uh, I have to say that every time I see someone of this generation, I want to hug them to thank them for their commitment to this country. Then we get to the silent chosen generation. Uh, it's very interesting. This generation is when we, for the first time, saw the suburbanization of America. You left downtown and got out of there as quickly as possible to get a piece of earth that you can defend. It was the highway. It was a single family home. It was the suburb, the traditional family. So many of these individuals are elected officials today. And many of them are enlightened. But many of them still see the world through the single home suburban lifestyle and just have a problem with urban and density. It just doesn't connect. And there are elected officials. There are decision makers. So I don't fault them because they understand the orientation of what community, neighborhood, and family means. So we just have to have conversations. And again, many of them are enlightened. This generation, too, understands the value of savings before they buy. And there was a huge rise of the manufacturing and middle class under their watch. And so again, this is a very important generation. You need to understand when you plan, you have to keep this market in mind. Then we get to the coolest, edgiest generation on the face of the planet. <laughs> boomers, I know you're in the room. It's our boomers. Now, this generation is interesting, not because we're so cool, but really, it began this idea of lifelong prosperity. You know, we're immortal. We want it because we want it because we want it right now. That's our attitude. We're going to make growing old look so cool. You've got to see the commercials. They're already starting. But what's interesting is that while we saw the greatest explosion of prosperity ever, about the boomers, and the greatest recession happened under our watch, where my father's generation gave their today for our tomorrow. And I apologize, boomers, on one of them. We were the first generation that started giving away your tomorrow for our today. That's where we are right now. This national debate that we're having is about, well, I want it right now. But unfortunately, I have to sacrifice your tomorrow to get it. And that's the conversation we're having right now, how we plan our communities, 
how we fund the things that we want to fund. That's the debate that we're having right now in our country. Then we get to Gen X. Any Gen Xers here in the room? A few. How many Gen Xers have more than three siblings? Okay, a couple. Now, this generation is interesting. We went from the baby boom generation to a baby bust generation. And it's kind of uncommon for an X family to have more than three children. I mean, there were a couple in here, so I could tell they had some healthy parents, drink lots of milk, lots of children. But generally, uh, you started seeing the family for the first time start to erode. Women started going back to the workforce. You started seeing divorce rates start to rise. And then all of a sudden, something called latchkey kids, daycare centers. Those didn't exist when I grew up. We had a daycare. I mean, you had my grandmother. That's who took care of you, your aunt, someone in the neighborhood. Today is daycare centers, and then we had latchkey kids. And then you had these untraditional families, stepbrother, stepfather, stepcat, stepdog, all these informal families coming together. That never happened before. And so we saw this change happening under the Gen X generation. And I believe because the Gen Xers, most of them just were the only child, and they played with their imaginary friends all the time, you know, that I believe that's why Richard Florida really has them at the cutting edge of the creative class, because you spend all that healthy time by yourselves and playing with your imagination. So I think the Gen X is the creative class. Sorry, Gen X, but you know, there aren't a lot of you around. My wife's a Gen X. I can tease her. Then we get to the oh my goodness, the Gen Ys. I always say you know a Gen Y because they want to be CEO and president of a corporation after one year on the job. So we know our Gen Ys. <laughs> one year, that's all it takes. I put the time in. Uh, I'm going to tease you a little bit about the Gen Y because I have something interesting I want to say. But what I like about uh, the Gen Y is that this is the generation that wants choice. And this is the analogy that I use. And my wife gets upset. She did it again on Saturday. When I grew up, I asked my mom what was for breakfast. My mom said, uh, pancakes. My wife, uh, again this Saturday, went to my daughter. And she said, my daughter said, you know, uh, what's for breakfast? And my wife sat there and says, we have Pop-Tarts. We have cereal. We have eggs. We have waffles. When I grew up, I had two choices. You ate or you didn't eat. My daughter gets a full menu. And the thing is, is that we as boomer parents raised you on choice. And the problem is you now have grown up. You don't just want choice. You demand choice. In fact, our whole culture got that way. Did you ever hear the term transportation choices and housing options? Don't you dare force me to do anything. I want choice. It's now part of our culture. That's the product of us for generations feeding our children on choice. My daughter texts me her Christmas list every Christmas. Could you imagine that? She texts me her Christmas. I would pray for just one gift, one. And my daughter just texts me in just a long list. Now they have um, Elster. Did you hear about this? So, yeah, it's like Kris Kringle at Elster. You could actually go online. It's, it's, it's scary. But anyway, let me get back to Gen Y. What I like about Gen Y is that, you know, they call them trophy kids. Everybody wins. Nobody loses. If you came in last, that's OK, because you showed up. But this is why I tease Gen Y. They're saying that 80% of your generation, if you're part of this generation, are volunteering. Intern, do work on one condition. It's got to have a purpose. It doesn't have a purpose, you walk. We're seeing in your generation the first purpose-filled generation we've seen since basically the 1960s when us boomers were a lot younger. And all I can say is thank goodness because it came just in time. Because all those emerging trends under your watch, it's now married up with the most purpose-built generation we've seen. And the X's have a little bit of that as well. And so I thank you for that commitment because we're actually seeing a change in your behavior with tactical urbanism and its new commitment to new things that we haven't seen from your generation in quite a while. So it's perfect timing. You prefer urban lifestyle. You're environmentally conscious. You're more racially and culturally tolerant than previous generations with all these emerging trends. I'm comfortable because I believe your generation will finally deal with this race issue that previous generations did not have the courage to deal with. So I look forward to working with you to solving these problems. Place matters, not job. Your generation moves to a place without even having a job. Who does that? <laughs> I, I like that place. I'm moving. I mean, who does that? And you're freaking us all out because that's not how it works. <laughs> and so we now know that place matters. And a lot of you are voting with your feet of where you grew up because that place doesn't appeal to you anymore. Even though you have memories at that place, you desire something different. So it's really changing the game. 
Gen Z, I won't spend too much time. They're young. They use smartphones at the age of three. They know computers. I don't know what to say about this one. The jury's still out, but they have a lot of similarities to Gen Y. Um, so we'll see what happens over time. But definitely, definitely a very different uh, generation. So what are the implications? What's exciting is that you're now the largest cohort boomers. There's 80 million of you. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, millennials. There's 80 million of you. There's 76 boomers. That you're now going to start to influence our generation like the boomers did uh, when I was coming up. So the pressure is on, all of you. I'm taking names and I'm done. <laughs> but also, you're going to see this tension, and you're seeing it now. There's going to be this clash of values as the mature and boomer generation start to retire and move, and you see a rise of the X and Y over leadership. You're now seeing Ys are now starting to turn 30. And you're starting to see this power shift, and that's the struggle that we're seeing in our country for how we plan for our communities, how we make funding decisions. The balance of power is going to start to shift over the next 10 years. And it's going to be exciting to watch this slugfest because this is what democracy is all about. But you will see this happening, and the 2020s will be the decade when single-person households will surpass that of a family. So this change is coming, and we need to be prepared. I love this slide. Uh, I'm watching my time to make sure I don't go overboard. But let me tell you a little bit about I call this the XYZ factor. What does it tell me? Number one, if it's in red, I broke down each generation. I included Raleigh, Boston, Cambridge, Massachusetts, the United States, so you can see what the national average is. Uh, Raleigh usually stacks up quite well, but I have to say Cambridge and Boston, wow, impressive numbers. I'll show you what I mean in a second. Everything in red is the X, Y, and Z, basically your population under 45, 46, and under. And then the bottom number is showing what your split is. Now, I've traveled a lot. The highest I've seen is the mid-70s. I've seen numbers as low as 30. But the point I'm trying to make here is that basically if 70% of your population is 45 and below, that means these are the individuals who are in control and power making the decisions for your local communities. And my question is, can this 30% give their today for their tomorrow when it comes to planning? You know what the answer is? No. No. We're planning for the next 20 years, and even though we may not be here to see it, we're going to make you live the way we think we want you to live. And we're at that turning point. You saw the numbers. We've got to start thinking differently about how we plan. More urban, more compact, more choices. And unfortunately, people who are in power know what they know, and the answer is no. We've got to keep it the way it is. Yet the market's changing. What business person does that? You see the market changing? We're not going to change a product type. Kodak, we're not changing. Polaroid, we're not changing. We're keeping it the way it is. You will be out of business. That's where we are. Now, what also is interesting is that, wow, you have an impressive Gen Y, millennial generation. The key is you want to keep this group in your community. In Raleigh, we're able to absorb and keep the Gen Xers in so the Gen Ys stay. But look what happens in Boston. You're losing your market share. Cambridge, you're moving, moving, losing your market share. No surprise. Uh, that is an issue. You want to keep them there because that helps drive your economy. Businesses, look at the brain power that you have. Now, these numbers are healthy, uh, but you want to make sure you keep them in your community. I've seen numbers where these things are pretty bad. Tuscaloosa, I did their numbers. There's no place to work. There are no jobs. They, Alabama educates these young people, and then they leave and go to Raleigh or Boston or somewhere else. You want to keep that talent that drives your economy. I could spend a lot of time on this list. But all I can say is Boston and Cambridge, these are powerful numbers. I can see why your economy is strong. These are very, very positive numbers. So for you, at least for this visit, this is good numbers. Bravo. However, Massachusetts, your highest population are boomers. <laughs> so I'm sure there's a lot of no going on when you go out there outside of Boston to plan. Am I right? You get a lot of no, especially these town hall democracy. No, no, and no. But things are changing. I don't care, no. So my heart goes out to you. You got work to do. <laughs> so what we're doing now is that what I try to do is that the younger generation, when we have meetings, they were all people who were older. And I said, time out. We can't let them decide the future of the city because we're missing a whole 70% of our population. Young people, they don't do meetings. So we decided to engage in social media. And guess what? All of a sudden, the issues started to equalize. Well, we got a no. Now we got a yes. And so now council's like, wait a minute, because the older generation come to public meetings. Young people don't do public meetings. So we exploded our outreach, blogging, social media, 
and for the first time, that 70% that really weren't engaged, they're very engaged in Raleigh, and that's how we're able to be very progressive in how we plan. So when someone says no, they come up and say, wait a minute, or no, I don't want a rental, I'll take a young person and say, excuse me, can you tell this person how you feel, this nice graduate from NC State, tell them how you feel, why you don't want this nice young man in your community. And I think they're putting a face to it, because in their minds, rental, you know, how many people ever rented in their life? Just by, by show of hands. Like, are you bad people? Should I like run and hold my pockets? We have this image of rental as some evil people, and I think we have to demystify that since more and more people can't afford to buy a home or don't want to. So we have to demystify rental. So we use this strategy. We also had a big kid at cities. We had a big ideas, met in a tavern. People were shocked. The planning director was in a bar holding a meeting. Yes, we were. And we held Kid City because these kids will be grown-ups when we reach 2030. We actually had to give them, uh, they had to get a permit to build this Kid City. They actually had to go to a desk, fill out a zoning slip and a permit. And some of them freaked out. We said, you can't put manufacturing downtown. They started rolling over the floor, crying, stamping their feet. <laughs> I said, what are you, a future developer? And, uh, I'm sorry. So, I like developers. Those are so uh, let me keep track of time here, having fun. So communicate the value of planning and the outcomes of planning. In Raleigh, what we try to do is when we do planning, we don't want to hold up a plan or be proud of a process. We want to show them the outcome. A streetscape, a neighborhood transformed, a public space, not a report and said, look what we did. We want to connect planning to place for people that they can see and experience and so we had the, because Raleigh is known as one of the best places uh, in the United States, but the reason that it happened is because planning we use as our competitive advantage. Places that plan are better off than places that don't. And in our market, we use planning as our competitive advantage. Business people looking to invest $100 million say, can I see your plan? I want to know what you're planning for the future. So I know whether I should invest here or in another state. And I'm like, are you serious? A lot. Head of economic development, they want to know what's your plan for this community. Planning is important to us. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, I had a good fortune of meeting all the, four, all the other three planning directors. We had four in Raleigh since 1950. I'm the fourth. By the way, I'm the black guy. If you didn't recognize me, I'm somewhere on that list. If you, I'm just, okay, I'm sorry. But we had an event and all of them came to an event and we tried to explain to them, what, not going forward about visioning in the future, what did planning do for them that they can see? And so we had this whole exhibit and a symposium about two years ago. Herb Stevens, the first planning director in the 1950s. I mean, we had nothing. He started doing land use maps and came up with a concept called the Green Fingers, which later became our 90-mile greenway system, all because of a man thought about Green Fingers and looking at our topography. That's planning. Yes, that was planning. That was Herb Stevens. He's still alive, 94, still flies planes. A.C. Hall came up with this wonderful concept called uh, tree protective yards. When you come to Raleigh, all of our thoroughfares have these beautiful trees like a parkway. That was A.C. Hall's concept. People said that was planning. Yes, that was planning. That's what I love about Raleigh. That was planned. So people are now making the connection and see the value. My predecessor, George Chapman, he came up with the Liberal Streets Plan to focus back on the urban core after years and years of sprawling out. And now we have a great, incredible downtown that was planned? Yes, that was planned. People now understand the connection by going back to show them what planning actually did in their community. And then I came around in 2005 and felt it was time to do a new comprehensive plan because we now are a 21st century city. We have time to grow up, do things differently. This was approved in 2009, uh, and so it took us a couple of years, but now we have a new direction going forward. Our challenge, that's our city, we were growing by 120,000 units and 170,000 jobs in 20 years. And we only had 19,000 acres. We could no longer do four units to the acre. It would not work. We'd run out of land. And so everybody woke up and said, we need to plan. I said, what did you say? We need to plan. I said, I agree with you. And the council, for the first time, gave us money to hire a consultant to do a plan. And it was adopted. So we knew low density was no longer an option. Remember I said, frame the issue, and then the public will follow along. And so this is what we came up with, a polycentric growth framework map. All of our new growth will be channeled into these eight growth centers and these multiple corridors. And if you want to live in suburbia, that's all in yellow, be happy. 
But now, for the first time, we're offering choices. When I moved to Raleigh, I had two choices. I could buy a suburban home or I could buy a suburban home. And now, for the first time, we're now providing more choices. So the seniors that I was talking about, we're now planning all of those senior living along our transit line, the multimodal corridors, and they feel very good and we have their support because we tracked the issue early and we took the uncertainty out of the equation. We now have a new code and I'm proud to say the reason why I'm a little bit tired, it was approved last night after working on it for two and a half years. <clears throat> It was painful. I didn't expect it, but I'm glad it happened. So after two and a half years, our plan was adopted in 2009. We then followed on with the code to implement the plan, and so that was approved. So we have a new form-based hybrid code that was approved. But as you can see here, we're very concerned about reaching the market demand. And so we're very concerned about uh, aging, lifelong communities. And so we had a couple of features in the plan, which I'll show you in a second. This is the one that was most popular, called a cottage court more density without going vertical. You could take two lots, combine them. These are small units. It could be a condo, it could be a co-op, it could be rentals. And now seniors can live in a space that's in walking distance of services and because they all want to age in place. That's their number one priority. So that was one of the things that was now passed. The development community was like, yes, 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 they could not wait. Now, it doesn't have to be for seniors. It could be for young couples, singles. We now have good. Now, backyard cottages. We also wanted to do accessory dwellings. Backyard cottages, we are so excited, and oh, guess what? Got next last week. I know, isn't that so cool? Look how nice that looked. I mean, <laughs> but what happened was all the neighbors were so concerned that they ended up pushing this literally to the middle of the backyard because they wanted a 30 yard setback, a 30 yard setback. They made so many limitations that I just said, let's just let it go. And so we're hoping to bring it back if there's more public support, but. Unfortunately, backyard cottages are gone. Let me get to the last part of my presentation and talk about economic development. I believe this is something planners need to think about. We stopped. We somehow gave it away to economic developers. Uh, but this is something planners definitely have to pay attention to. The reason why I say this is that as planners, we plan for land. And land is an asset. There's property tax. There's sales tax. Uh, and to me, planning equals economic development. It's about the plan, it's not just about the deal. And now that I'm over both departments, you know, some places are about the deal making, I believe it's about the plan making. If you want to make a deal, make sure it's within the plan. So now we actually have those two working hand in hand, you see how that works. So I knew as a planner that I affected basically 40% of the city's tax base from the land. That's my asset. That's my contribution to the city, and you'll see in a second what I was able to do. So everybody said, stop developing downtown. All you do is develop downtown, downtown. And so I came up with this chart to show them exactly what impact that meant by saying no. This 600 home subdivision on 150 acres equals the tax value of one of our acres downtown of a high rise. 150 acres, one acre, same tax value. So I said, so this building offers 90 times the tax value as that subdivision. So if you say no to downtown development, what you're really saying, as a homeowner, I'll pay the taxes, increase my tax load. If not, let's have a conversation. And we started to talk to the residents about a new way to plan, a different spin on planning. In fact, if you look at a downtown high rise, this is from a colleague of mine in Asheville. Basically, on a three acre site, it would take three years to pay off the infrastructure, return on investment, 35%. A suburban counterpart on 30 acres would take 42 years to pay off its infrastructure. Return on investment, 2%. And if you put these through the average council, time after time after time, you think they would vote for that, but they vote for that. And they give away your tomorrow for our today. And this is where we are across America. And we're beginning to see the cost of doing this type of decision making. Now, planners don't often show this stuff. Here's another example. So let's compare the Walmart to a downtown product. Forget about the high rise. So we have this Walmart, again, from my colleague in Asheville, on 34 acres, that mixed use building, five acre, half an acre. Taxes it collects. This building collects 10 times more than the Walmart. What about jobs per acre? Walmart, six. This building, 74. We don't have these conversations with our elected officials. We just go, Walmart, Walmart, jobs. Retail, sack, tails tax, wow. But there are other some impacts that we have to think about. 
And as planners, you have to look at the value of land. So we took a look at Raleigh. The darker the color shows a more value. Here's our downtown. I'm like, I'm not seeing anything. So I told my staff, can you put this in three dimensions? And they did. So please tell me where you think downtown is. I mean, would you look? This downtown is probably paying the tax load for the third. This is our midtown. This is inside the Beltline. This is probably paying a third of our city. So if you say no to that, then folks out here, be prepared to pay more taxes. And now the public understands this. And we're actually, there was just a blog uh, last week where they're showing how we're doing new future growth planning by ROI planning. So it's something that's quite new. Not a lot of people are doing it yet. So this is all the land we expect to rezone, and this is now going to capture more value of land in our city. Last piece, which I'll answer, uh, as designers, experience of place matters. I tell staff that we're not just planners, we're experience builders. We're building experience in our community. And we have to make sure we do that because that's what attracts people. And so we took from APA the Great Places program, and we're actually in the business of creating great places in our community because now we understand the connection between the land value and how it can change. And so we're doing that. And so here's one example. They said nobody would come if we reopened our street, which was mauled back in the 1970s. We reopened it. 100,000 people came on opening day. That $25 million capital improvement, which everybody said, don't you dare spend that money, waste, 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 it's now generated close to $3 billion in investment in just six years. That's a powerful ROI. And as a result, we're now one of the lowest tax places, taxed municipalities in North Carolina. Smart planning, quality community, low taxes, because we looked at the value of land and tried to put it all together. Planners, if you want to show your value, if you want to be valuable, you have to show your value. And this is one of the ways that we're doing it in our community. Now, we're going to come to a close. APA took a survey and found out, surprisingly, that 79% of the American public supports community planning. I was personally shocked by these results. It was across the political spectrum, geographic and racial. 79% support planning. People love their communities. They truly love their communities. And when you ask them what are the top five priorities that you, planners, should be working on, job creation, safety, schools, and by the way, schools is economic development. And keep that in mind if you are running a school district. Protecting neighborhoods and water quality. And guess what? They want plans to work on it. Most of us don't work on these things. Guess what ranked at the bottom of the list? Urbanism, land use, transportation. Public didn't care. Not they weren't important. They said these are your priorities. So there's a disconnect between what the public wants and what we're providing. And so for that reason, because Americans love their community, I want you to fall back in love with planning again. America needs you to fall back in love with planning again because of these emerging issues. They need you. And in fact, I'll challenge you, and the CEO said this, can you start falling in love with the solution? I'm sorry, we can start falling in love with the problem and not the solution. So you can meditate on how to deal with this issue going forward. So APA has come up with a strategic plan to help plan for uh, our organization for the next couple of years. You can read this yourself. But the real tag nine is to lead, inspire, and innovate. That's what we're trying to do for this profession. And the big question is, what's next? which was a question I challenged here, and we now launched an entire forum throughout the year to have this conversation. It will be a report done later this year about what we as planners need to do about what is next. Uh, just some of the issues that I believe over the next 50 years we'll be dealing with. Consolidation, regionalism, change in governance, 89,000 local governments that cannot stay the same. Demographic change, public health, water, et cetera. Building codes and material. I think you heard what I said earlier. I do believe that these are some of the emerging trends that we have to deal with. I'm going to read you something from our strategic plan, and then I have one more slide before I close. This is from our strategic plan. It says, we, planners, must inspire our members to reach new heights of creativity, energy, and innovation in planning. A new era in planning is underway. Whether we call it a planning revival, renaissance, or rebirth, we must communicate to leaders and decision makers that planners protect the public interest and our guardians of our common, fu common future. Based on emerging trends, we are the profession of those who are not only looking at the long-term consequences of present actions, but are working on solutions to reduce uncertainty about the future while enhancing the quality of life. So in closing, I'm going to ask you, 
who is going to address these emerging issues in your community? I mean, that's a question you're going to have to ask yourself. Can we give our today for the next generation's tomorrow? And that's a conversation we have to have among yourselves and your local communities. Remember that there are consequences for actions, but equally there are consequences for just saying no and taking no action. The problem is not going to go away. And remember the great planning legacy you will leave behind for present and future generations. And then finally, your country needs you, your planet needs you, but most importantly, your community needs you. Thank you very much. <laughs>Thank you very much. I think we have time for about five to ten minutes of questions before we go repair to the reception that's outside the auditorium. Um, I actually might just let Mitch uh, take questions, so if you put a hand up and um, if you have any questions or comments. Is one right here in the front? Yes. Oh, we have a microphone. That'll help. A great presentation. Uh, what advice, uh, given the rampant <laughs> nimbyism that most planners and developers face and so many better off communities uh, where you have a, a, a relatively wealthy suburb, homogeneous, completely developed, no transportation, no mass transit, and no desire to get it, uh, and no desire for uh, densification, Do, would you just write off that community as a place uh, to try to, uh, uh, try to develop and uh, plan for greater density? Well, I mean, if it's fully built out and their tax base is strong, they don't need you know, unless there's some legal reason why they have to diversify for affordable housing reasons, I, I would leave it alone. I mean, I don't know what else. I, mean, I, I like to know the local context because sometimes when I'm asked questions, there's actually a real example going on right now and out and I'm walking into a trap. But if you're saying a community is built out, uh, you know, I, I'm really not sure how to answer that question, to be honest with you. I think I need to know a little bit more about the community, but generally, uh, I'm used to dealing with growing communities. If it's stable, you certainly want to enhance your tax base. If there's some rural land, you want to add more options for housing diversity for seniors. So to me, I'd have to understand where this community is headed, what are some of the trends, before I can respond about what they do with their land. If they have a tax base that's spiraling out of control and they feel that they can afford it, well then that's that community's determination. But I'm sure some people would like to see a more diversified land base that they can actually start to disperse that taxes so it won't be escalating high. But if it's affluent, and they could afford it and they want to pay for it, I basically would just leave it alone until, you know, there's some sense of urgency that would require us to step in. Yes, sir. <sighs> well, LEED has its own separate certification. Uh, we are beginning to see uh, green codes and a desire for energy efficiency get into some of our codes. So I don't have a problem with that. I think it's, in the end, all good. Uh, my hope is that the actual building codes of the material we use, that those standards increase, because my concern is about the quality of our construction, particularly for single-family homes going forward. But I'm all for better quality and lead standards solely getting into our codes. So I'm not sure if I get anything more than that, but I just think it's something that is positive. Yes. Oh, uh, I enjoy the presentation very much. Okay. Uh, you start out by saying that you're very interested in race, and you yes. did talk a little bit about race, um, but you didn't really talk about um, segregation, poverty, and uneven development. Um, in my experience as a planner, that's still a very major issue. I spent a few years in Baltimore where there was a, I think, 40% uh, graduation discrepancy between the census tracts with the highest African-American and the lowest and a 20-year life expectancy difference. I'm just wondering why you didn't talk about that and if you have thoughts for how planning as a profession might right. address some of these issues. As a planner, I know where my intervention level is and you raised some issues which honestly for a planner, this is a coalition building type thing that needs change. Can planners lead that and raise the issues? Certainly. But the issues you raise, if you go down to the root causes, are generational are racial, are socioeconomic, and are so deep and broad of its implications, I don't know how I can put together a plan 
to deal with those problems. I mean, that's generational changing to, to deal with all those issues. You know, if I look at it, at one point, it was probably a stable community, and there was an out-migration. I mean, there are just multiple factors that contributed to that decline, and it would take equally, if not double the effort, to reverse some of those trends. So as a planner, I always look to find out when I work with the community, what is my intervention, what's the public intervention, and what could be changed. And I'm not going to shoot for something where I know that me as a planner alone can't solve it. This would take an entire coalition and legislators and community activists to turn the tide. And there are examples across the country of places that can do that. But that was one powerful statement about turning a whole community around. When we do neighborhood planning, I don't believe in neighborhood revitalization. I believe in neighborhood restoration because it's not just about the buildings. It's restoring the soul of that community. But that takes some serious commitment on an ongoing basis. And so my feeling is unless a local government or a nonprofit is not willing to commit the whole way, I'm concerned about even getting into it because far too often these communities, they've been planned to death and promised to death without seeing little results. So that was a heavy issue you asked, but I do believe it's a coalition building effort and a commitment to see things change. But I didn't mention it because I don't know why I didn't mention it. <laughs> yes, sir. You, uh, in your presentation, there was a slide that listed the uh, challenges uh, posed to the planning profession yes. in different eras. Uh, in your opinion, how successful uh, did the planning profession meet those uh, challenges? What would be the, the track record of meeting emerging challenges, and what makes you confident that the profession will succeed in uh, the next generation's challenges? Well, I think it goes back to just our enabling legislation that allowed planning in the first place. Now, you can look at Europe and other places that had planning way before us, and I have to say those countries that had a culture and a history of planning, in my opinion, uh, look very differently than those that do not. So I think the fact that certain countries that actually had a planning history uh, to them, uh, to me, I think that the benefits are quite obvious in terms of how land patterns develop. Now, one can argue about suburbanization, but I think, in my opinion, that just following through uh, on planning, understanding how all our systems are connected, to me, it's been quite successful. I mean, if I had to point to just one thing, it's hard to do that because the profession is quite broad. Uh, but certainly on environmental fronts, planning has made an impact. Now on public health, planning has made an impact. On building codes, people were dying because of the ways that we were just building for people, light, air, sanitary conditions. So I think just in terms of the overall public health, safety, and welfare of our public, I think we got it right as well as some other countries as well. So to me, that would be my contribution. And so if that is the measure, I think planners have met their purpose today. And if they remember public health, safety, and welfare, they can meet that challenge tomorrow as well. <clears throat> so thank you. I really enjoyed that presentation. I thought you really demonstrated, let, laid out a vision for how planners can be proactive rather than reactive, which is, of course, the nature of the discipline. Um, but I wanted to ask a question more specifically about the APA as an organization. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there are recently there's been a number of proliferation of organizations such as Reconnecting America, the Congress for the New Urbanism, that are these smaller organizations, more multidisciplinary. And how does APA and hence sort of the planning profession maintain a proactive role moving forward in this ecosystem where there are so many organizations that are looking at issues from different angles? Well, APA is an educational organization just like Harvard, GSD. And a lot of people don't understand that. We are primarily our articles of incorporation that we are an educational institution and we have a professional arm that certifies planners. So that is our primary mission and we have to make sure we produce those educational opportunities for our members. In terms of where we get engaged, we are more multidisciplinary. I think a lot of people, until they actually go into our website and look at what we do, uh, we're leaders on public health, on hazard planning, on so many issues. We have a global presence working in Brazil and China. And so you'd be surprised once you get into APA. Now, are we the ones that tweet and broadcast everything we do and penetrate to the young demographics so they know everything we do? No, but I think that on certain areas, we're very mission-driven. Uh, we're recognized in a lot of different places. And so I think the more you get involved in APA and know about APA, you'll appreciate all the benefits. We have 40,000 pages of web information, and I, a lot of information, but we are certainly leaders in a number of areas. We're not as singly mission-focused as like CNU on urbanism or T for America on transportation. Our membership is broad, and we cover all those topics. A lot of people don't see us as kind of that niche organization. We're kind of an umbrella 
for a lot of different issues. And as a result, it's difficult to understand our personality, but we're primarily an educational organization. There was a question? Yes, sir. And then I'll move toward the middle. Well, assuming it's primarily, you know, it's Sounds like he doesn't need a microphone. <laughs> Planning is primarily a, a local and even neighborhood issue, and it should certainly s remain that way in many respects. However, you could argue that a couple of the most dramatically uh, improved uh, planning regimens in the country have come at the state level, Oregon's urban growth boundaries, Massachusetts 40B for affordable housing. Uh, do you see that as a way uh, uh, for planners to function in the future? It's a little dicey, but... Are there certain kinds of issues where we ought to say, I know this is going to be tough medicine for you, local communities, but you really need to take it? Is that going to happen more? Should it happen more? Or do you not like that idea at all? I don't like that idea. I think that I'd prefer an option because right now the reverse is happening. We have some states that are looking at the enabling legislation and actually changing or limiting what local governments can do. I prefer that local governments, because each location is different, should determine their own destiny. And so I'm not sure whether the state planning level is the location. Regional is something I think we could all agree on. And my biggest concern is that the way our local governments and our structures set up, if we don't allow for more or encourage more regional cooperation, which to me is the bigger challenge. So if I had my choice, I'd want states to somehow incentivize and empower more local governments to do more regional planning tax sharing, whatever it is, which is a dangerous word, uh, to me that is where the real key is. So, uh, but that's what's been missing and we've been trying to solve that problem for a hundred years and very few locations have been able to crack that. There was one gentleman right here in the middle and I'm looking for Ann for time. Okay. Okay. This is the last one. No idea You're asking some really tough questions, I have to say. I've been to a lot of places and like I have to like stop and think for a second. So. Uh, you're showing off your brains and talent here at Harvard. Thank you. Uh, so my question may be on this. We're here at a, at a planning educational institution. I'm affiliated with MIT mm -hmm. down the road. Are, are, as the leader of the profession, are you getting what you need from the scholarship and ideas that are coming out of the of accredited programs? And you know, what, what do you want to see more of and, um, to make sure that you know, the, the research and education is lining up with, with the demands that you outline? Well, we went through this whole conversation with the recent change of criteria through the Planning Accreditation Board, so I think we're very satisfied. I think some of our concerns were making sure that the emerging issues were on your radar screen because we know they're coming, and we wanted to make sure that uh, both the professors and the practitioners involved in training are having conversations because we're scratching our heads of trying to figure out what we need to do. And we're looking for that innovation and creativity and people knowing what is happening. Uh, I believe those conversations are happening. It may vary from program to program, but I think more of the elite programs are getting it. And so we're just trying to communicate that we want people coming out, understanding uh, planning, design, but also the equity side, which a lot of places uh, really fall short on. Because as I said earlier, planning is about place and people, and you can't separate the two. Uh, so to me, the emerging trends and emerging challenges uh, and there will, that was my list, the list could be broader, is something that we're hopeful that will be discussed so when you come out of school you'll be kind of ready and, and understanding uh, of what's both facing us present day but what's also coming uh, in the future. So that's one of the things I think we discussed and communicated quite well in, in the new PAB criteria. And I think that is the last question. So let me thank all of you and I will see some of you in the reception.